Now, before I introduce my next speaker to the stage, because I'm now back on track, I think, am I? I am. We have a video to play first. She, I have been reliably informed I'm not to say a word about this person until we play the video. So, is there a video coming on? <laughs> glad we played that first. I am so delighted we have our next speaker because you know what? Startups in Ireland are not just all technology startups. There are lots of different startups and you can talk about user experience and technology but ladies we all know the challenges of applying fake tan properly and there are lots of disasters and user experience for that product is incredibly important. So for Miss Coco Brown, Marissa Carter herself, thank you so much for joining us. Marissa over to you. Hi. <laughs> I won't stand behind that because I don't know if you'll see me. <laughs> um, I'm always nervous about accepting uh, speaker invitations um, and not because I'm particularly nervous about public speaking, but because I always worry that people will find out how short I really am in real life. Um, so I grew up in a, a council estate in a, a place called Rathfarnham in uh, Dublin and um, my Mom was just 17 when she had me, so um, our, I suppose our, um, our lifestyle was, was modest growing up. But one of the things that mum really believed in was uh, the importance of a, a good education and what that could, um, what opportunities that could then give you in life. Um, and so she made my dad drive me and my seven other brothers and sisters um, yeah, seven, <laughs> so I'm the eldest of eight. Um, but my mom made my dad drive us every day 14 miles uh, down to our primary school and then 14 miles home. So he worked as a waiter, so he would do the lunch, he would do the, he'd drop us to school and then he'd go do the lunch shift in the restaurant and then he'd pick us up from school, drive us home and then go do the, the night shift. So um, from my dad, I think similarly to, um, to what Maeve said, you know, she learned a great deal from her parents. And I think what I learned from my dad was that um, hard work really was the only way to, to get anything in life. Um, and then from my mom, I think I learned that tenacity and resilience um, were two really key uh, factors for whatever you were going to achieve. Um, so when I finished my leave insert and I did all right I, I think I got like 445 points and um, my parents were delighted and I was delighted and off I went to DIT Anger Street to study management and marketing with French and um, my parents obviously thought that this was fantastic that they had done their job and that and um, they had succeeded in raising me because i was off i was you know off to college and then at the end of my first year in dit i failed um four out of my seven end of year exams and um broke my parents' heart when I told them that I wasn't going to go back to college, I wasn't going to repeat the exams, that I was going to take a year out and um, I was going to go to uh, beauty college. Um, and my career in beauty kind of started um, a little bit happy. Well, you know, it kind of went the roundabout way of ending up in beauty. So what happened was I heard that there was a, a job opening um, in a beauty college in town, they were looking for a receptionist and um, I had just lost my job as a waitress um, for being extremely forgetful. So my family called me Dory, as in from Finding Nemo, because that's how bad my short-term memory is. So um, anyway, I went for the job um, interview to become a receptionist in the beauty college and I was offered the job and then I asked the two principals of the college when they were offering me the job if there was any chance that they would allow me to study 
um, their part-time beauty therapy course um, and that the tuition fees, which were, I think, about three and a half thousand euro, if they would sort of waive those fees for me and allow me to just sneak in on the on the course and um, because I couldn't afford to pay for the college fees. And so for the first time, but definitely not the last time um, in my career, I would owe a great deal of my success to the generosity of other people and in particular women. Um, so. I studied beauty therapy, I loved it. I ended up then teaching beauty therapy for two years in that college. And then I decided that I wanted to open up my own beauty salon. And I thought that a great way of, you know, sort of, I wanted to do kind of what Maeve had done. I wanted to learn on someone else's dime. So I thought it'd be a great idea if I tried to get a job working in a beauty salon as a beauty salon manager before I opened up my own beauty salon. Um, but surprisingly enough, with my zero experience managing a beauty salon, I couldn't get a job and I had already left my job in the beauty college. So I thought, right, what am I gonna do? I'll go down to the Dole office and off I went down to the Dole office and they handed me forms this thick and said, right, come back with you know all of that. And I looked at the forms and I thought, nah, to hell with that. I'm not going on the dole. I'm gonna just open up my own beauty salon. So I was renting a house at the time uh, with four other young guys in Still Oregon and I asked the four lads, I said, lads, you know that laundry room at the back of the house? Do you mind if I turn that into a beauty salon? They said, yeah, grand, no problem. I had four willing receptionists for my beauty salon to make cups of teas for all my lovely clients that were coming in during the week. Um, but then the landlord found out that I was working from home and he rang me and he said, you gotta stop that. So I had 2000 euros saved and I had, I got a loan from Bank of Ireland for 2000 euro and with my 4000 euro, I took out a lease on a commercial premises which became Carter Beauty, which was my beauty salon that I ran for eight years before um, I got, um, well, two things happened. First was my husband and I, uh, well, I became pregnant. Um, he just, you know, <laughs> helped with that. Um, so first thing was I was six months pregnant. Second thing was I got a brown envelope in the door. Um, any of the other fellow people in business up the top there will will hopefully sympathize with this. Uh, so I got a brown envelope in the door and I um, had been doing my own bookkeeping and I surprisingly enough got chosen for a random revenue audit and um, I went through a horrific time trying to get everything in order for the revenue for about three months and I was nine months pregnant when I went in to meet with the revenue and my accountant for the last time. So they were basically, I was meeting them for them to give me my final bill of how much I owed them. And um, I was, well, my husband was driving and we were on our way in to meet the accountant. And this was 2000 and, um, 2012. And we were smack bang in the middle of a really bad recession. And Ryan Tuberty was on the radio interviewing a lady who um, was telling him that after 10 years, that day was going to be the last time that she would, um, well, that she would close the doors on her clothes boutique for the last time. So she was going out of business, the recession had done it to her. And I just remember turning to my husband and in all, sincerity saying to him like what is the story with prison and babies do they let the baby stay in with you what if you're breastfeeding like how does that work and he just said to me look you're not going to go to prison whatever it is that we owe the revenue we will figure it out and it's not going to be the end of the world and once you're healthy and the baby is healthy that's all that matters and so we were smacked well i say we again me 
I was smacked with a bill of over 50,000 euro from the revenue. And at the time, I wasn't taking a salary from the business. Um, I was barely able to cover the rent. Um, you know, transferring money from my savings accounts to try and cover the wages, telling my employees at the time, listen, don't cash your check today, will you cash it on Monday? Hoping that the money that would come in over the weekend in the salon would then be enough to cover the, the wages. Um, so things were awful. And so when I got the revenue bill, I just remember thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna be paying this off now for the rest of my life. My salon's gonna have to close down. My world is ending. And then about two weeks later, um, my baby boy, Charlie, was born. And um, my, my, I think my, I know I might sound trite saying this, but in all honesty, my priorities completely changed. And it gave, I, I just remember thinking, do you know what? Really, all that matters now is our little family. And that sort of stopped me from panicking about money. And it, it allowed me to, to feel just a little bit creative again. And I had been to Philadelphia in 2007 to take a very short introductory course to cosmetic chemistry and skin histology. And it was a course aimed at beauty therapists like myself that wanted to start their own beauty brand. Um, and the course was supposed to allow you then to have an intelligent conversation with a cosmetic chemist. Um, and when Charlie was about three weeks old, I decided, do you know what, it's time to get out of the pajamas, it's time to, you know, get out of the traxy bottoms and I'm going to put a nice dress on and I'm going to put a bit of makeup on, I'm going to wash my hair um, and before I do all that, I'm going to do the most important thing and I'm going to go down to the salon and I'm going to get a spray tan. And I had my spray tan, I went to bed that night to allow myself to cook and develop. Um, and I woke up the next morning and I was a ride, but my three week old baby boy was also beautifully bronzed. So the side of his face, the palm of his hand, his little shoulder where he had slept kind of cuddled into me uh, during the night. And I just remember thinking two things. The first was, holy sugar, how am I gonna hide this from my husband? And the second thing was, I'm gonna do something about this. And so I contacted um, a cosmetic chemist in the UK who had written um, a journal entry um, describing how uh, DMI or dimethyl isosorbide, an ingredient that was being used in pharmace the pharmaceutical industry in acne products, how that ingredient could actually be used with tanning products to speed up the development time, um, but it hadn't been, it ha this scientific discovery hadn't yet been implemented um, in the commercial environment. So no one hour tan existed. And I began the process of creating the world's first one hour tan. Um, and then there was only just one really small problem that I had no money and I was in loads of debt. And so I, and, had an idea that I would approach a distributor. Um, so there are about maybe six or seven different distributors in Ireland who sell all the different beauty products that you see on shelves in pharmacies. There's only about seven or, six or seven or eight or whatever, a small amount of distributors in Ireland. Um, so I approached one of them um, under the guise, so I got the meeting under the guise of hi, I own a beauty salon, I'd like to come in and I'd like to see what beauty products you sell so that I can then sell them in my salon. And so they gave me the meeting and, um, you know, they thought the meeting was over and then I decided actually, no, the meeting's only just started because I have this idea I want to tell you about. And so I pitched very much like you would see in Dragon's Den, um, I pitched my idea that I had this idea for a one hour tan, it didn't exist on the market, I had this really cute packaging um, and all I needed was an order. And they said, yeah, gee, you're like this sounds like a great idea. Yeah, we sell loads of different tanning products, but we don't sell any one hour tans. We've never even heard of it. It sounds really exciting. Um, we'll give you an order. And I said, great, that's fantastic. Now, the only thing is, I need you to order 25,000 bottles. 
and they were like, how many? I said, I need an order for 25,000 bottles. And they were like, right, okay, why do you need an order for 25,000 bottles? And I said, well, the thing is, I want this product to be sold um, in pennies. Uh, I want this product to be the best selling tan in Ireland. And in order for that to happen, I need you, I need my product to sell for under a tenner because at the time, all, you know, all good tanning products were in and around the 20 euro mark. Um, and there were loads of tanning products that were in and around the four, five, six, six euro mark, but they were really bad quality. Um, so in order for me to get the manufacturing cost of the product low enough for me to make enough of a margin to be able to sell that product to customers at 10 euro, I needed to order a hell of a lot of product. And the distributor was like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, that sounds like an awful lot of product. Like, I don't know if we'd sell that in a year. And I said, yeah, no, I think we, w I really think we will. But the other thing is, I actually need you to pay for the production of the product. And they were like, right, um, what do we get out of this? And I said, what you're going to get out of this is you're going to get exclusivity. You're going to be the exclusive distributor for this product in Ireland and the UK. And they said, well, we don't even sell any of our, pro we don't sell any products into the UK. And I said, no, 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 but we will sell this product in the UK. Uh, there's no other one hour tan in the world. They're going to want this. Um, and they kind of said to me, look, don't call us, we'll call you. And off I went, and that was that. And then I don't know what happened, I don't know what market research they did, but they must have put the feelers out there to their 1,200 pharmacies that they stocked, and they rang me three weeks later, and they said, you have a deal. We'll take exclusivity, and we'll give you an order today for 25,000 bottles. Um, and nine months later, um, this week we're celebrating our fifth birthday. Uh, so the 26th of November 2012, Coco Brown One Hour Tan hit shelves in Ireland. Um, and about six months later, we were sold in, we began being sold in pennies, which was the dream. And then about three months after that, we were then so we began being sold in Superdrug in the UK. Um, today, oh sorry. The 25,000 bottles, they sold out in nine weeks. Then we doubled the order to 50,000 and they sold out in five weeks. And today, when we manufacture batches of Coca Brown, we manufacture in batches of 250,000 bottles at a time. Um, we are sold in about 20, yeah, about 20 different, 20, 25 different countries. Um, I've lost count now. Um, we are sold in, a, in almost 15,000 different retail stores around the world. Um, and just to give you an idea of um, like our, our, the Coco Brown's growth in comparison to the overall, say, tanning industry. So the tanning industry in general has a growth rate annually of about 15%. Our growth rate has been between 25 and 30% year on year. Um, we haven't taken investment. Um, we are exploring that avenue now, um, just as the business is growing and kind of um, the demands on the business are, are getting bigger and bigger because we're, you know, we're not just, we're a global business now. Um, yeah, so that is my, my Coco Brown story. Thank you for listening. <laughs>